I only caught a glimpse of her at the moment, but she was a lovely woman with a face that a man might die for. So says Sherlock Holmes in one of the most popular of the Conan Doyle adventures, A Scandal in Bohemia. Hello, and welcome to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Peggy Weber, and I had, as a young actress, the good fortune to perform with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce on some of their Sherlock Holmes radio broadcasts. To Sherlock Holmes, Irene Adler was the woman. A great deal has been made of this over the years in many a pastiche, and even in some recent feature films, implying that Holmes was in love with Miss Adler. But we must not lose sight of the true nature of Sherlock Holmes. As Dr. Watson writes, Holmes was a man to whom all emotions, particularly that of love, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably balanced mind. It would not be in Holmes' nature to be in love with such a woman. We must also bear in mind that outward signs of love in the Victorian era were suppressed. Women were considered second-class citizens, creatures who stood behind their men, bred and raised their children, and stood by silently and supportively. Such forward women as Irene Adler were considered loose women, a woman who was, in the words of the King of Bohemia, an adventuress. Holmes accepted this label placed upon Miss Adler by his client, but did not have so narrow a mind about women himself. He might not care for them, but he certainly did respect them, especially such a formidable woman as Irene Adler. Miss Adler was a benign adversary to Holmes, for in truth all her actions were to protect herself not to bring harm to the great detective or his client, the King of Bohemia. Miss Adler's cunning, her awareness, as well as her immense beauty, and her ability to best Holmes, who rarely lost the game, are the traits that endeared her to Holmes from the moment he realized she had outfoxed him. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in the classic adventure, A Scandal in Bohemia. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know something? I had an adventure tonight I wish you could have shared with me. I had a steak about, oh, an inch and a half thick, tender, juicy, and with it I had a glass of Petri California Burgundy. Now there's a combination, steak and Petri Burgundy. That Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. It's a rich red wine that's hearty and full of flavor. Flavor that comes right from the heart of the grape. And don't think that Petri Burgundy is only good with steak. It'll make a hamburger sandwich taste like a feast, too. Try Petri Burgundy with any meat or meat dish. It's just wonderful. And serve it proudly, too, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> Now I know Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're quite muffled up tonight, I see. Overcoat, scarf, and gloves. Slip them off and come and join me by the fire. Thanks, Doctor. It's quite a nip in the air tonight. Yes, there is indeed. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's story centered around the activities of a brilliant and beautiful woman. Yes, my boy. Her name was Irene Adler. But I never knew Holmes refer to her by any other name than the woman. <laughs> she sounds mighty intriguing. 
Uh, how did you happen to meet up with him? Well, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. One night, it was on the 20th of May in 1888, to be exact, I was returning home from a visit to a patient when my steps led me through Baker Street. Since my marriage, I haven't seen much of Sherlock Holmes. And you the... couldn't resist stopping by at 221B, I'm sure, Doctor. <laughs> oh, of course I couldn't. As I stood outside the well-remembered door, I looked up at the lighted windows and saw the tall, spare figure of my old friend pass twice in dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk on his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew every mood of his and habit of his, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was hot on the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell, and a few moments later, found myself standing before him. You look in splendid shape. <laughs> yes, Holmes, I'm feeling very well, thanks. And in practice again, I see. You didn't tell me that you'd gone back into harness. Oh, well, how did you know? Elementary, my dear chap. If a gentleman walks into my rooms, smelling of iodoform, with uh, a black mark of nitrate of silver on his right forefinger, and a bulge on the left side of his hat, to show where he's uh, secreted his stethoscope, I should be dull indeed if I didn't pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. <laughs> Just the same as ever, Holmes. By the way, I'm... Uh... Not interrupting you, well, are you? Well, you are, old fellow, but it's, um, it's a most welcome interruption. You're working on a new case? Um, it looks like it. This letter arrived by the last post today. It's undated and has neither signature nor address. Read it. Let's have a look. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted. This account of you we have from all quarters received. <laughs> uh, be in your chamber, then, at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. It's got it. It's all very mysterious. What do you imagine it means? Look carefully at the note, old fellow. What do you deduce from it? Well, now, let me think. Well, the man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper couldn't be bought under half a crown a packet. And it's peculiarly... Strong and, and stiff. Peculiar. That's the very word. It's not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. Don't you notice anything? Yes. There's a large E with a small G and, and a large G with a small T. That's right. Woven into the texture of the paper. What does that suggest to you? The name of the maker, no doubt, or perhaps his monogram. Not at all, my dear fellow. The G with the small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is the German for company. And the E-G? That stands for Igria. Yeah. It's a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. Oh, so the paper was made in Bohemia? Undoubtedly, my dear fellow. And the man who wrote the note is a German. How do you know that? Observe the curious construction of the sentence, This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. Hmm? It's the German who is so discourteous to his words. Oh, there's your clown now. I, I, I better go home. No, 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 unless you have to. Well, I... I could stay. I thought that... Ben, stay, you... old chap. I'm lost without my Boswell, and this <laughs> promises to be interesting. I, um, I told Mrs. Hudson to let the masked visitor come upstairs unannounced. Come in. Good evening, sir. You, uh, you received my note? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in, won't you, and sit down. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say anything before him that you can say to me. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as uh, Count von Kram. How do you do, sir? You must excuse this mask that I wear. Uh, the august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you, and uh, I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I'm well aware of that fact, sir. You see, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, the matter I am about to discuss uh, implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of uh, Bohemia. That has not escaped me either, sir. In fact, if you will state your case, I shall be the better able to advise you. Your Majesty. Uh, how did you... Yes. Yes, I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed? I shall remove the mask. There. Mr. Holmes, I have traveled incognito from Prague for the express purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult. Briefly, the facts are these. Some five years ago, uh, during a visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventurous... Irene Adler. Irene Adler? We know of her, Your Majesty. Uh, look her up in the index for me, will you, Watson? Yes, it's right beside you on the desk there. I uh, imagine that the name would not be unfamiliar Here to you. Here we are. A. Abraham's Acton Green Hatchet Murders. Adler. Adler. Splendid, Adler, splendid, old fellow. Hand me the file, will you? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Irene Adler, born in New Jersey in the United States in 1858, contralto. Mm -hmm. Prima donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Mm -hmm. Retired from the operatic stage, living in London. Quite so. And here's a recent notation. Uh huh. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how did... Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? No. Then I feel to follow Your Majesty. If this young lady should produce her letters for blackmailing purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the handwriting. Well, that could be a forgery, Your Majesty. But it was private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. What? We were bought in the photograph. Oh, dear, oh, dear. That's very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Well, did you inscribe the photograph, Your Majesty? Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. I'm afraid I did. Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes. It must be recovered. Perhaps if you were to pay enough, the photograph might be bought. She refuses to sell. Oh, stolen, then. Uh, five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked our house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. Oh, dear. It's quite a pretty little problem. Uh, it is a deadly serious one to me. Your Majesty, what does Miss Adler intend to do with the photograph? To ruin me. Oh, how? Well, I... Uh, I'm about to be married to the second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. She is the soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. Mm. And Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph to your fiancé, I suppose. Yes, and she will do it. Rather than let me marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. Are None. you sure that she's not already sent it, Your Majesty? I am sure. Now, why, Your Majesty? She said uh, that she would send it on the day my betrothal is publicly announced. That day will be next Monday. Splendid. Then we have still um, three days yet. Uh, Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at the Langham Hotel, registered as uh, Count von Kram. Just two questions before you leave, sir. What are they? Is the photograph large or small? Quite large. And uh, it was in a heavy frame. I see. And what is Miss Irene Adler's London address? Brioni Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Uh, thank you, Your Majesty. Good night, and I trust we shall soon have some good news for you. I am placing all my hopes in you, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Good night, Dr. Wallace. Uh, good night, Your Majesty. A fascinating problem, Holmes. I, I wish I could help you with it. You can, my dear chap. Huh? I shall be glad of your company. Oh, splendid. Uh, what's our first move, Holmes? Well, a good night's rest, I think. We'll meet here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then? Then, my dear fellow, we will see what we can find out about Miss Irene Adler, late of the Warsaw Imperial Opera Company and at present residing at Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. <laughs> A cursory examination of Brownie Lodge didn't prove very illuminating. No, a bijou residence that represents the essence of dignified suburbia, but tells us very little about its owner. I think a visit to the local public house might prove more instructive. Come on, old chap. I see the door to the coach and horses inviting us from across the road. Well, our disguises shouldn't cause any suspicion, Holmes. That's why I suggested them. In the character of a couple of stable hands... I felt that we might inspire confidence. This is a horsey neighborhood. There's a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among the fraternity. There we are. Better let me do most of the talking. Yes, I will indeed. I'm sure that your accent will be more convincing than mine. Let's go in, shall we? <laughs> Will it be, mateys? Half a bell more, please. Uh, how about you, Charlie? All of the same? Yeah. Two halves of old and mild. <laughs> well, <laughs> here you are, mateys. That'll be a tenner. Uh, have a drink with us, Governor. Oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> I'll have a Guinness. You, uh, blokes new round here? Yes, that's right. Come over from Clapham. Clapham, eh? Um, <laughs> well, here's looking at you. Ah. <clears throat> Hunting for jobs? That's right. Uh, we was told that Miss Adler, across at Briony Lodge, needed a new coachman and a groom. Well, it's the first time I've heard of it. It might be true. Uh, have you been over there to ask? No, not yet. 
We thought we'd find out something about the old girl first. <laughs> she ain't no old girl, matey. <laughs> She's the prettiest young thing you ever saw under a bonnet, and that's a fact. You know her, Governor? Why, of course I know her. Used to drive her carriage, I did. Uh, uh, for I uh, can't work here. Oh, what's she like? Oh, nice little lady, as you'll find, Jim. A work yard? No, no, no. She, uh, she lives quiet, like. Uh, goes out uh, singing at concerts once in a while. The rest of the time, it's money for Jim. She goes out for a drive in the park every day at five and comes back to dinner at 6.30. Uh, the rest of the time's your own. She ain't married, you say? No, no. But uh, she's got a bloke what comes to see her all the time. Uh, he's a barrister. Nice gentleman. Uh, Mr. Geoffrey Norton is his name. Good-looking fella. Uh, wouldn't be surprised to see him get spliced. <laughs> Sounds like a cushy job to me. Come on, Charlie. Let's get out of the house and see what's what. Much obliged to you, chum. Well, <laughs> good luck, mateys, and, <laughs> and thanks for the dinners. What's our next move, Holmes? Let's stroll back to Briony Lodge. I'm undecided whether to continue my investigation there or to try and find out something about Mr. Geoffrey Norton, the barrister. If he's just her lawyer and nothing else, it's more than likely that she's entrusted the photograph to his safekeeping. Uh, hello. There's a cab waiting outside Miss Adler's house. Hurry, Watson. Maybe Mr. Norton's. Here, here we are at the gate. Yes. Here comes a man hurrying down the pathway. Quick. Flatten yourself behind this post. Listen. Where to now, Mr. Norton? Drive like the devil. First to Gross and Hankies in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in the Edgeware Road. Half a sovereign if you do it in 20 minutes. Right, Char, Mr. Norton, up in. Try and signal the cab, Watson. We must follow him. Well, here comes one. Oh, no, it isn't. It's, it's a private carriage. It's heartless, no doubt. Here she comes down the pathway. Back behind the post again, Watson. Where to, Miss Adler? The Church of St. Monica's, John. And half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. The game's afoot, Watson. Quick. We must get a cab and follow them. Well, here comes a hansom. Hi, cabby, cabby. Here. You blokes got enough money to take a cab? Here's a half sovereign for you, my man. Right you are. Where to, Governor? The Church of St. Monica. In the Edgware Road. And another half sovereign for you if you get us there in 20 minutes. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, but let me tell you something. If you're going to have chicken for dinner tomorrow night, or any night, don't forget to serve that chicken with Petri California Sauterne. Believe me, Petri Sauterne is just about the last word in white wines. It's beautifully golden in color, it's delicate and intriguing in flavor, and it's just, <laughs> well, you taste it and see for yourself. If you want a delicious white wine, you certainly want a Petri Sauterne. Well, Doctor, once again, you broke off your story at the most exciting point. Did uh, you and Sherlock Holmes reach that church inside the 20 minutes? Yes, Mr. Bartell, we did, but the other carriages were there before us. Holmes went into the church after telling me to guard the outside. I must have waited for 10 minutes or more before Mr. Jeffrey Norton and Miss Adler came out, spoke a few words to each other, and then left in their separate conveyances. A moment later, Holmes, still dressed as a stable hand, came striding out of the church and down the steps towards me. He was obviously very excited. Watson! Watson! Have they left? Yes, in separate cabs. I overheard him say that he was going back to his office. And she said, I shall drive out in the park and at five this evening. Splendid, old fellow. And come on, we can return to Baker Street. Uh, what happened inside the church? Home? They were married. Married? Of course. The ceremony would have been illegal if it had been performed after noon. That accounted for their wild dash to the church, jumping to the cab. Where to now, Governor? 221B Baker Street. Oh, so they, they got married, eh? Yes, and it may amuse you to know that I acted as witness at the ceremony. Oh, you did? But how did that happen? Their, their own witness had failed to appear and I was dragged into the breach. The uh, bride gave me the sovereign as a memento. I uh, think I'll wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. What an amazing situation. Things begin to look better for the king, don't they? Yes. Now that she's Mrs. Norton, the chances are that she won't want to expose his majesty after all. I hope so, Watson. I hope so. But we can't afford to take any chances. I think the time is right for us to come to closer grips with the lady. Well, Holmes, now 
now that we've eaten, perhaps you'll tell me your plan. With pleasure, my dear fellow. And while I'm so doing, I'll proceed with applying the makeup for my new disguise. Another disguise? What's it to be this time? I think the character and appearance of an amiable and simple-minded nonconformist clergyman would be most suited to my plan for entering Miss Adler's house. Are you going to try and enter, then? I must, dear fellow. Yes, huh? I'm sure the photograph is there. Miss Adler, or rather Mrs. Norton, will return from her drive in the park at 6.30. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already made my arrangements. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may, you understand? I'm to remain neutral. Yes, there will be some small unpleasantness. Don't join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. As soon as I'm able to, I shall open one of the windows. You have to watch from the outside. When I raise my hand, you will throw an object which I shall give you through the window and at the same time cry fire. Follow me? Entirely, but what am I to throw? Oh, it's nothing very formidable. Well, here it is. Huh, looks like a great big cigar. What is it? Just an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at each end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to throwing it through the window. When you raise the cry fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You will then walk to the end of the street and I'll rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I've made myself clear. Perfectly. Good. And now, old fellow, as soon as I've joined my clerical attire, let's be on our way. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> Nearly 6.30, Holmes. We've been pacing up and down in front of her house for half an hour now. I hope she does come back. I'm sure she will. There seem to be a lot of loafers hanging around her gate. All part of my conspiracy, old chap. You'll see them play their parts in a few minutes. You still think the photograph is inside the house? Yes, I'm sure of it. Hmm? It's most unlikely that she carries it about with her. Remember, the king told us it was a, a large frame picture. And also remember that she'd planned to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands on it. It must be inside her house. But her house has been burgled twice. They so don't know how to look. Well, how will you look? I won't. I'll get her to show me. She'll refuse. No, she won't be able to... Shh. Here comes the carriage now. Remember, Watson, carry out my orders to the letter. Yes, you can trust me, huh? Blimey, here comes the Duchess of Tillowigs. Let's put out the carpet. She might get her tootsies wet. Ah, oh, put a sock in it, Elfie. Leave him alone. She's no better than she ought to be. Please let me through. I live here. Well, ain't that nice? We'll all come in and have a cup of cocoa. <laughs> Move out of the way, please, and let the lady through. Mind your own business. Just because your collar's turned the wrong way, you can't spoil our fun. That's right, Eddie. Keep your nose out of it, Parson. Please, please don't fight about it. I tell you to stop molesting the lady. Do ya? Then how would you like a biff in the nose? <laughs> oh, he hit the poor man. Then he ran away, the coward. Is the clergyman badly hurt? He hit his head, Mum, when he fell. If you ask me, he's hurt bad. He's bleeding something terrible. Can we bring him in, Mum? He can't lie here in the street. Why, of course. Bring him in. Right you are, Mum. Here, Bert. Right out. Give us a hand. Uh, here we go. Oh, poor fella. Do you see what happened to him, mister? Yes, I saw my good woman. A very convincing demonstration. What you mean? Uh, weren't you paid by a, a certain gentleman for this performance? Oh, you knows about it too. Yeah, you must be a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, um, I am. Nice gentleman. He give us five bob apiece for tonight's work. It ain't through yet, though. We got to start yelling fire when somebody tells us. I'm that somebody, my dear lady. There's Mr. Holmes now. He's inside the house. Yes, he's opening a window. And now he's raising his hand. That's my signal. Now to throw the rocket. Uh, there we are. Ah! Ah! <laughs> You have the photograph? No, but I know where it is. She showed me as I told you she would. I'm still in the dark. There's no mystery, old chap. When my accomplices started the round the street, I had a little moist red paint in my hand. As my good friend Alfie pretended to strike me, I clapped my hand to my head and fell down. It's an old trick. Yes, I understand that, but uh, how did my throwing the rocket help you? It was all important, my dear fellow. When a woman thinks her home is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing she values most. A married woman grabs her baby, an unmarried reaches for her jewel box. In this case, of course, it was the photograph. Well, where was it? In a recess in the living room, just above the right-hand bell pole. I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I made it known that the fire was a false alarm, she replaced the photograph. As soon as I was able, I assured her that I was feeling well enough to leave. You didn't take the photograph, then? No, I felt that uh, 
over precipitance at this stage might ruin everything. And what do we do now? Drive to the Langham Hotel and inform His Majesty of what has happened, then return with him here. And after that, my dear chap, the case will be ended. <laughs> This is Barney Lodge now, Your Majesty. Yes, I am all impatience. Your certainness photograph will still be there, Mr. Holmes. I have every reason to believe so, Your Majesty. Mm, I, I must confess, uh, this is going to be something of an ordeal. And I suggest that you let me do the talking, Your Majesty. I think I know how to handle the lady. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. Uh, yes. I am Mr. Holmes. How did you know? My mistress told me that you would be likely to call. She has left for the continent with her husband. You mean she's left England? Never to return. Uh, then the papers, the photograph. Oh, all is lost, Mr. Holmes. We'll soon see. Follow me. She said you'd be looking for something. I hope you find it. This was the bell pull. There's a sliding panel behind it somewhere. Ah, here it is. Uh, is, uh, is the photograph there, Mr. Holmes? There is a photograph, but it's a photograph of the lady alone. Uh, here's a letter, and it's addressed to me. Well, what's it say, Holmes? My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. Until after the fire alarm, I had no suspicion. But then, when I realized how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I'd been warned that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. May I congratulate you on your disguise as the dear old clergyman? Great Scott, you were far more clever than you thought, Holmes. Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. What else does it say? Uh, let me see. My husband and I both thought that the best recourse was flight. So you will find the nest empty. As to the photograph of the king and yourself, his majesty may rest in peace. Thank goodness for that. I love and am loved by a better man than he. Hmm. I leave another photograph, however that he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay Adler. What a woman, Watson. What a woman. What a magnificent woman. She fooled me completely. But, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I, I've been unable to bring your business to a more successful conclusion. Uh, on the contrary, my dear sir, nothing could be more successful. I know that Irene's word is inviolate. The incriminating photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I'm glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Now, pray tell me in, in what way I can reward you. This uh, barrel uh, ring that I wear, <laughs> I should be proud uh, your of. Your majesty has something that I should um, value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph. I think this photograph? But certainly. However, you must let me give you something more substantial. Oh, no, 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 Your Majesty. This is uh, something I shall treasure all my life. This and a golden sovereign I received from the lady's hand. They will remind me that I was once tricked by a woman. A woman that I shall never forget. <laughs> Mrs. Adler. Or should I say, Mrs. Norton? Ah, that's the kind of woman I could really go for, Doctor. Yes, you could. Just between ourselves, you know, I sort of, uh, well, uh, I sort of could go, go for her myself. <laughs> she was intelligent. Yes, yeah, she was rich. Beautiful. That's the kind of woman you want sitting next to you in front of a cozy fire on a nippy fall night. Just the three of you. The three of you? Mm-hmm. You, she... And a glass of Petri Port. Miss <laughs> Bartelli. <laughs> Why not? That Petri California Port is some wine. Boy, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine, all right. And no wonder. Look at all the experience they've had. Ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the art of selecting perfect sun-ripened California grapes and making them into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the label of every bottle of Petri wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. 